God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. We want to welcome you to The Way Church this morning. It's our Back to Church Sunday, and we are so excited because we believe that this day we're going to reconvince us who may already be convinced and convince you who are skeptical about the top 10 reasons why you should go back to church. And you already experienced two of the top 10. You, you got the countdown ready. The first number, 10, the reason we should come back to church is because we have great worship. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I know that's right. Come on, tell him, I know that's right. The number nine reason why we should come back to church is because we love to pray. We pray for our communities. We pray for our world. We pray for one another. Give somebody else a high five and tell them, you better keep praying for me. That's why we coming back to church. All right. Now, the, 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 the eighth reason why we like to come back to church is because we have healthy community. All right, I think we're caught up. So in order to demonstrate this healthy community, we're gonna invite you to get out of your seats, go find someone you don't know, introduce yourself, ask them, can I shake your hand? Ask them, can I give you a hug? Tell them your name and tell them you're welcome into the house of the Lord today. Welcome, welcome everybody to the way. He's worthy, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. clap your hands everybody, yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right, God bless you, have your seats, have your seats. I don't know about you, but I feel good to be in the house of the Lord today with all you God's people on Back to Church Sunday. I just want to thank all of you that have joined us on this Sunday where we believe the spirit of the Lord is in the building because you're in the building yeah. and you brought the spirit right along with you. Is that all right? Yeah. If this is your first time hanging out with us today, we want to thank God for you being here. So come on, everybody, put your hands together. And let's thank God for all of our special family members and friends and special guests. I just hope that you already are starting to feel a little, a little warm on the inside. As the John and Charles Wesley brothers used to say, that when they came into the house of the Lord and the spirit moved, they were strangely warmed on the inside. Uh-huh. And, and if, 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 you, if you don't feel strangely warmed on the inside, you feel strangely warmed on the outside. That's just a little bit of the prelude, amen. We usually get worked up first on the outside and then the inside, or some people get worked up on the inside, then it comes to the outside. But we're just so glad to have you. We are here to just have a wonderful service of welcoming people back to church. And we were thinking, you know, some people stop coming to church for all kinds of different reasons because they meet folks who are mean at the church. They don't like churches because they're 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 uh, uh, obsessed with money or or they 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 their politics is bad. Or they, or they don't uh, welcome folks who are different than them, or, or all kinds of reasons. Their theology is a little bit, you know, needs an upgrade, an update, you know. Uh, and so we thought that we would spend today just focusing on the top 10 reasons why we are excited to welcome you back to church. And uh, rather than one of us preaching to try to give you some good ideas at the end of service, we said, why don't we just preach all the way through the service? Now, the blessing of the 9 a.m. service is that you and I can't stay here all day. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Because we have an 11 o'clock service where we got to kind of do it all over again. But our preachers are excited because we all get to test our ability to preach between five to seven minutes on one of the reasons why we are excited to welcome you back to church. And so one of the first uh, preachers that we're gonna have coming to preach about why you should come back to church 
on this topic, topic number seven, she's coming to preach about church being home. You should come back to church because church is home. Put your hands together for Pastor Erna as she comes. Oh, thank you, front row. Y'all need to sit down. Let's sit down. Woo, thank you, Brother Wayne. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, I need to set a little timer even. I'm going to live on just all his purposes. All right. So when we talk about feeling at home here at The Way, we uh, come at it in a couple different ways. I love, I think that people feel seen. They belong. We want to, you to know that we see that you are made in the image of God. We want you to have a, an emotional connection with other people and a social connection. I mean, honestly, sometimes I feel like you, know, you can go through your whole week, and especially you can be on all the apps on your phone, but you're like, have I had a real, actual human in-person, intimate connection where I wasn't putting up an Instagram front, where I didn't put a filter on my life and my mental health, but I really brought my whole self. And what I want to talk about is I think you should come back to church, and why I hope you will come to this church and call it your home is because you can be yourself. You can be yourself. And we will see you for who you are. I had a really interesting experience that made me feel like just 15 to 20% cooler than I actually am. My friend came in from out of town, and she lives in Atlanta, so it was very unexpected. And she's like, hey, I'm going to be at this friend's house. Why don't you come? There's going to be an a in-home poetry show. And I was like, yeah, that's what I do. I'll go to in-home poetry shows for sure. Uh, that's what I do. So I went to this guy's apartment. I hadn't been there, and there was like 20 of us. And it turned out I knew the poet. It's this great poet. His name is Micah Bournet. And he's, um, I love his poetry. He addresses lots of difficult issues, deep issues. And for like 45 minutes, it was this really intimate setting where he's just reciting some of his poetry to us and uh, some of other people's poetry. And he told a really interesting story. He recently came out with an anth anthology. It's called Fight Evil with Poetry, which is interesting, right? And he talked about wearing a shirt that has that slogan on it. And he said the way people responded to him was so interesting. Because he's like, you know, he, he said, typically as a black man walking around on this earth, people don't like assume they have a lot of assumptions. They superimpose their assumptions about who he is. And he's like, as a black man walking in this world, I experience people's assumptions about who I am all the time. But when I started wearing this shirt, people, instead of superimposing some assumption that I'm not a safe person to be around, people started coming up to me and interacting with me all the time. And they would be like, oh, do you do poetry? And he'd be like, yes, I am a full-time poet. And then they would start talking about their poetry and how they wrote it or they used to wrote it, write it or they'd like to write it, and then it would pivot to their whole life story. And he said what he took away from this or what he realized was that people's assumption when they saw this shirt and when they realized that he was a poet was that they saw him as a safe person that they could tell their whole story to. And I think that's a very interesting assumption to have about a poet. But what I loved was that he was sharing a story, and I think we all experience this, where we experience people superimposing assumptions about who we are, but what feels at home, what feels like belonging, is when you feel like people actually see you for how you are. And I think sometimes church doesn't feel like home because we feel like church, we cannot come as we are, right? We feel like um, we have to start putting on a certain, certain act. Like, uh, yes, I doth quote thy scripture with frequency. Like, we feel like we have to start talking and praying and talking about the Bible in ways that we would never talk about anything else. We might feel like we can't pretend that we have struggles, Right? We can't come in here and be real at like, how was your week? We feel like every week we have to be like, blessed, even though inside you're like, <laughs> you know, you're like, actually, my anxiety was super acting up. I definitely need like a switch in my medication. Like, my therapist and I are not connecting. Uh, my boss is gaslighting me. Uh, I can barely cover rent here in the East Bay, and my car got broken in too, but I'm blessed. Now, I'm not saying... <laughs> I'm not saying that we need to like, um, you know, that we can't trust that God is good all the time, but I think sometimes church doesn't feel like home because we don't feel like we can bring our full selves. We can't bring just our messed up, broken, in the middle of life self. We can't come, and I want to say that you can bring yourself how you are here at The Way. 
and I think that we will feel at home. We don't have to pretend that our marriages are perfect. We don't have to pretend our love life is perfect. You know, I feel like what I love about this place is we have people with such diverse stories. I think sometimes then what happens in church, too, is we feel like, well, everyone has to have the same story. And what I love about the way is we have family whose story is connected to being incarcerated, people who have a testimony about coming out of drugs, but we also have people who have a testimony about being, like, overly uptight, about being on the straight and narrow for their whole lives. And we're like, we're not that much fun and, like, overly religious and just found out that Jesus doesn't care about that stuff as much as you thought. We have people on, like, all ends of the spectrum. You can be at home here. Here's the other thing I would say. You don't have to pretend to be a certain way. You don't have to pretend that you are always the perfect parent. Do you know? Like, there's a lot of parent pressure. It's a lot of prayer and pressure on this earth. I'm not a child because, and I'm not a child. I don't have children because I couldn't enter that game, that intense arena. But there's a lot of pressure, especially on the internet. You know, I feel like people post, rarely do people post pictures where their child is like covered in the food and your shirt is covered in the throw up and you're just standing there like, I don't believe the God is real no more because my child is three. <laughs> You have to come in and pretend like, mm, we just, I just pray with my child by their bed every night and I'm just forming them like clay into the image of God. But we believe you can come as you are, as a parent, as a single person, as a married person, with whatever story you have. And the other thing I think makes the way a great place to call home um, is for, I experienced church as an incredibly alienating place for a couple of, for, uh, for different reasons at different times, but particularly, I moved to Portland in 2014 and I don't know if y'all remember 2014, but that was the beginning of a lot of, uh, uh, that was the beginning of the uprising in Ferguson. That was the beginning of, it felt like every other week there was a video that you were seeing of like terrible violence against unarmed black folks. And there was a lot of churches that were not addressing it. And let me let you know, in 2014 in Portland, no churches were addressing it. And I, um, I had been working for InterVarsity. I work with Black Campus Ministries, so the majority of my staff and students were black folks. Everyone was in massive trauma. And when I would go to church, and we would be all week on the phone, crying, processing, trying to get our, get our um, you know, leadership to address it, and they wouldn't, when I would go to church and there was silence, it made me feel like church is not a, a place where I can bring my trauma. Church is not a place where I can, that does, it doesn't connect to the world out here. Apparently, we're supposed to pretend everything's a certain way when we're in here. And what I love about this place, and I remember visiting the way a few years before I ever moved here to work here. And when I came in, and like literally in the opening prayer, it was like, Lord, just be breaking down white supremacy and also be helping these, these like unjust systems. I was like, oh, we doing this. <laughs> and I felt an exhale. And I felt at home. And so I hope that you will consider making this your church home because you don't have to pretend. You don't have to pretend you're perfect. It, the, the final image I'll give you is one of the things I taught my husband um, was he used to like, you know, you how you dress when you go out the house kind of put together. Um, but like Korean folks have a thing where it's like there's how you dress out in the world. And then like the minute you come home, you have your home clothes, which are like sweatpants and like that baggy shirt that's not cute. And my husband didn't do that. He would just wear his nice clothes all the time. But now I have taught him my ways. And literally, whenever we come home from anything, we're all like, blah, sweatpants. And I want you to feel like the way is a place where you can wear your home clothes and be yourself. Amen? Welcome to Back to Church. Pastor Erna, everybody. The way is home. If you believe that the way is home, Come on, just say, who wouldn't serve a God like this? Hey. At home, you know, you can play the kind of music you like to and stuff and, you know, do uh, uh, karaoke and act like you can sing and nobody's going to judge you. <laughs> you're like, I'm not that at home, Pastor Mike, not yet. All right, well, by the end of the service, you're going to be doing a karaoke, all right? Who wouldn't serve a God like this? That's the whole karaoke line, all right? So you're going to have about four more chances to karaoke while you're at home. Turn your tickets to the screen. Let's see what's happening at The Way this week. Welcome to The Way, and welcome to Back to Church Sunday. We're so glad that you decided to worship with us today. We want to help you connect, grow, and serve. So start by connecting and letting us know that you are here. Please take a moment to fill out a connection card. 
And here are some ways that you can plug in at The Way. September 23rd, our men's ministry will be kicking off with Monday Night Football and Fellowship. Catch the game and use halftime for spiritual growth and Bible study. Minister Wayne will be leading, so touch base with him if you have any questions. Starting next Sunday, our Charged Up ministry for teens is back. Charged Up is a fun, real talk, interactive small group for teens, which will take place every Sunday during the 11 a.m. service, starting next week. Do you know a teenager that could use a fun and relevant place to grow spiritually? We need you to bring every teen that you know. So invite your niece or nephew, family, friend, or neighbor. They're all welcome to join us as we discover how to follow Jesus and be on fire for Him. To kick off our comeback, there will be a game night on Friday, October 4th at 7 p.m. And Showers of Blessings will begin again this fall. Showers of Blessings is our ministry to our houseless loved ones in the community. We provide toiletry, clothes, and showers. We will begin collecting new and gently used sleeping bags for our next Showers of Blessings event. So please feel free to donate new or gently used sleeping bags here at the church. Once again, thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad that you've decided to be a part of Fact Church Sunday here at The Way. So as we continue to make our journey into the school year, we are feeling like it's super important for us to just ensure that we are investing in our children and our young people, uh, realizing that not only are they um, the most precious gifts that God has given us, but they are also those who will help carry on the next generation of transformation and faithfulness of all creation, God's church, certainly all of our communities. And so the top seven or the seventh reason, are we on seven? We on six? Oh yeah, seven was home. The sixth reason why you should come back to church is because we believe in investing in the next generation. We're gonna bring up our generation's pastor, yeah. Pastor Tanisha, she's coming. Yeah. To talk Lord, about everybody, that. I'm going to invite two of our wonderful youth. Uh, let me have Karina and Sarai. Would you please come up here? Come on. Here's a mic for you. Here's a mic. Hi, we're just going to interview them. Really, Aren't they great? Can you give them a hand? Aren't they beautiful? So hi, ladies. Hi. Hi. Can you tell your, your age, your name and age? Um, I'm Sarai. I'm Karina and I'm 11. All right. So I just have two simple questions for them. I want to know why do you love Yana? Yana is our young and not ashamed ministry. We are teaching our kids that they can be young, but we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of salvation. Can you tell us every Sunday we meet, we hang out, we worship? Can you tell me why you love Yana, Karina? Okay, I'm oh, yes. Down for that. Okay. Uh, why I love Yana is because, like, my mom talks about this all the time. It's like, like other churches that are like really like old fashioned. Like, it's just, <laughs> um, it's just like you couldn't really enjoy it because it's just like your mom or dad, whoever took you to church, just like, you're going to church. No, like, no, like, you're going. And then, like, even though my mom still makes me come. Uh, <laughs> Shout out to mom. <laughs> uh, like, Yana gives me something to do while, like, and uh, I, I'm still loving Jesus and praising him no matter what. And I'm still having fun as a kid. Thank you. Sarai, why do you love Yana? Um, I love Yana because when you go there, you can just be yourself and hang out with your friends. But at the same time, you're worship worshiping Jesus and like learning his ministry. Yes! Thank you, ladies. They are so wonderful. My 
we just pray that God will continue to pour into them, and we want them leading everything that we're doing. We always believe that the, the same Holy Spirit that we have, they have. There are no junior Holy Spirit. God can use them in significant ways, just like we want him to use us. So thank you, ladies. I love you so much. All right. I'm just so blessed by those two young sisters. Come on, y'all. One of them happens to be my daughter, my oldest daughter, Sarai Hope, uh, practicing her preaching. Amen. It's just so... No. <laughs> I'm just playing. You ain't got to preach, but you got to sing or do something. Praise the Lord. No, you got to do that either. Just be yourself. Amen. She reads so many books, she has a better vocabulary than me, but not her mom. Amen. Her... <laughs> Clap it up, everybody, for Lady Cherise. So glad to see her, as always. All right. So we believe in the next generation, and one of the things that we are going to be doing over the next several months, we're going to be adopting a new school in East Oakland called Fremont High School. Fremont High School, one of our young people here is the coach of the basketball team there, and we found out that the school district laid off all of their uh, money for their sports, sports program, reduced it from like $20,000 to $400. And many of the young people there are um, traveling to school carrying all kinds of weapons and things because they're afraid to go home after school and the coach is taking weapons off the young people. Uh, you know, they got a community gun that they keep in the bushes, amen, just in case. I mean, it's interesting what our young people are doing to try to get home safely. And so the after school program helps them to at least be in a safe place until their parents get off from work or, or our coaches or volunteers can drive them home. And so that's gonna be our next big investment and our next generation is ensuring that our young people have something to do after school in East Oakland. And we believe that our church is so invested in making sure we're blessing our young people that attend our church and even those who don't because we think that the church is supposed to be for everybody because we are all God's children. Amen? Amen. So the next generation is one of the main reasons why you should come back to church. All right. Reason number Five. All right, the fifth reason why you should come back to church is because we believe in justice. We are a church that believes that we are called to speak truth in the season of injustice and to come and speak on this topic is none other than the minister of justice, peacemaking himself, the great minister Wayne Clark. I'm going to let him get that because he's also the minister of working out. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. How many of y'all love the fact that we do a lot of justice in our church? Yes, yes. You know, um, you know, in my travels of, you know, this journey that God has brought me on, when I landed at the way, I, I'm like Pastor Ernie, my first time here hearing Pastor Mike pray about the mass, <clears throat> about the incarcerated and the violence, and I was like, oh, I'm home, you know, because I come from the streets. I come from West Oakland. I was once part of the problem, but thank you, Jesus, I'm now part of the solution. And, um, and so this, this topic was, you know, was perfect for me. Um, and Proverbs 21 and 15 says, justice is joy to the godly, but it terrifies evildoers. That's a scripture I always revert to in this work, because I, I, and to be honest with you, you can get discouraged in fighting for justice. Because what we see that's called the justice system, to me, most time it feels disguised as injustice. It's injustice. I see so much more injustice than I do justice. And so, as we talk about coming back to church, I love how the segue was gave by Pastor Erna talking about how she didn't see churches standing up for justice. And one of the reasons that we can come, that we love coming here and we love the fact that we come here and we actually push into justice. But one of the things that's a struggle is understanding how justice works. How are we supposed to work out justice? And in, in a lot of the churches that I see that are even trying to push into justice, it's still hard for people to get off the sideline to step into this work. 
And so today I just want to talk about the reasons that kind of push me and encourage me um, to, to, to step into justice. As the scripture says, it says, justice is joy for the godly. And I remember the first time reading that, I said, justice ain't joy at all. Like, I don't, I don't see no joy in justice. But I, as I've journeyed along this walk, it continued to study and meditate on that scripture. What I've come to understand is Jesus was justice. And so if Jesus was justice, then Jesus is joy. And so Jesus being justice equals joy. That don't mean it's going to be easy. It's a heavy lift. But this is why we're supposed to stay tied together as a community doing this collectively. And this is why we get weary and we're, and we're down because we're not doing it as a community and we're not doing it collectively. So as I, I, some of the things that I, I wish that I always tell people and remind people that Jesus came to be a representation of justice, he came first to heal the sick. Well, what does the sick look like in my community? We got a lot of people walking around addicted to drugs, addicted to all kind of things. Jesus came to heal them. What else did he come to do? He came to give sight to the blind. What is the blind in my community? So many people walking around lost identity, don't have an idea who we supposed to be, where we supposed to be going, where we headed because everything I see in front of me is dark and blurry, and so I'm blinded. Well, Jesus said, I'll give you sight, and I'll show you the light through the blindness. He also came to set the captives free. What does setting the captives free look like? Mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is inflicting our communities because you pull the men and the women out the communities, and then what does the family orientation look like? He came to set the captives free. I got so many brothers and sisters sitting in there been waiting for trial for two years. Why their families are struggling? He came to set the captives free. What else did he do? He came to take care of the, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, and the outcasted. It's funny as I read that, we got, we got so many widows because of the mass incarceration. So they strip our, our men out of the communities and then they leave our women to bear by themselves. And then you got babies growing up and they wonder why they is like they is. He came, he came. And lastly, I love, I love this scripture right here. Jeremiah 22 and three says, this is what the Lord says. Be fair minded and just, do what is right. Help those who have been robbed, rescue them from their oppressors, quit your evil deeds, do not mistreat foreigners, orphans, or widows. Stop murdering the innocent. I'll end with murdering the innocent. Because in these streets and in this work I fight, I see so many of my young brothers being gunned down and my young sisters being gunned down and ain't no justice coming to us at all. But not only do I see that, as I've continued to grow in this work and be around Pastor Mike and educate myself in, in this work, I've come to understand the militarization of the America and the innocent people who go over for this prophet called war. It's a prophet, that's a prophet thing. We, they, they make sure we fight wars every year. And then what? And so I like to highlight to people that this is the justice or the injustice that Jesus came. And this is what we get to be a part of when we come back to a church like we do have in a way. But this is what I want to leave you with. We must be proactive and not reactive. Jesus' justice, the godly justice, is proactive. It comes to make sure the vulnerable is protected before they are attacked. But this is not an easy lift, y'all. And we must do this all together. And so I'll leave you with the, the scripture of Galatians 6, 9. It says, do not get weary in your well-doing. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Don't get weary. Make sure you come back and be a part of a collective church. Because I know in isolation, we feel defeated. But when you got a place to come like this, you feel like you can keep on pushing through and have victory. Amen.
My goodness. What a great, what a great message, a great highlight of the fifth reason we do believe we should come back to church. We do believe that God is a God of justice, and we do believe that we are God's agents of reconciliation in the world. Uh, who wouldn't serve a God like that, right? A God that invites us to join in in making sure the world gets back to the original intent. Look at your neighbor and just bob your head like this, all right? I'm just going to teach you. Come on, say, who wouldn't serve a God like this? It's all right. Look at him. Act like you just saw a commercial you like to say, who wouldn't serve a God like this? Hey. Some of y'all are too cool, but it's all right. Come on. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? He's a good God. Who wouldn't serve a God All right, clap it up. We serve a God of justice. All right, we are at number... Four. And we think the fourth reason you should come back to church is because we believe in healing and laughter. It is not lost upon us that there is so much stigma in our churches around mental health and around taking care of ourselves. And so uh, here at The Way, we have been so proud over the last several years to invest over 50,000 something dollars for free mental health sessions for members of our church to go see a therapist uh, once a month at no charge to you. And we have found that it has been so important to try to break this stigma. And so uh, following this short video on stigma, we're gonna actually have one of our partners who are professional in making us laugh, come and give you some medicine this morning. Is that all right? So turn your attention to the screen and let's see a little bit about breaking this stigma. Right before I was diagnosed with bipolar two, before I became fairly suicidal, I was talking to a friend about it and he says, we're the descendants of the slaves that survived the middle passage that made us strong. You can do this. I think that was meant to be encouraging, but it didn't feel encouraging. It felt like you should be able to manage because you come from ancestors who survived. Why can't you survive? It felt like my friend had put the weight of the black race on me when I couldn't handle the weight of my own life. There's a large stigma around mental health in all communities, and particularly in communities of color and African-American communities. Most people still go to their religious leader before they go to doctors, sometimes because they still don't trust medical establishments. There are all types of mottos in black religious teachings that suggest that mental health challenges are different than any other kind of physical challenges. And we should be able to get over it by ourselves when no one thinks they're just get over diabetes or heart disease by themselves. Things like saying too blessed to be stressed can even be harmful because you can have blessings and still be sad. We do such a good job of being community for each other and lifting each other up. And if religious leaders were better trained in addressing mental health challenges and talking about self-care, maybe more black people would feel safe talking about it. We could all use a mental health checkup once a year, just like we get a physical checkup once a year. Mental health should be a priority for every individual. It's a part of our overall well-being. And if we don't put our health first, no one else will. Amen, amen. Let's give God a hand praise, amen? Amen. It's a blessing and an honor because the way y'all doing it. I'm, this, my name is Shell T. I need y'all to help me out. Could y'all say it with me, my name is Shell T on three. One, two, three. Shell T. Oh my gosh, I am so excited. I was looking at the title and it was like back to church and I think y'all should switch that around because y'all bring a church back to the people, amen? Amen? Because I'm listening to all the stuff and everything and that's real because it's difficult. I mean, especially you, she hit it on the nail, like boom, right on the head because I need Jesus. I need to be in church, God, because I got kids. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. I realized her energy and enthusiasm when she was like, but I don't have none. I was like, that's it, that's right. That's right. That's right. You don't. <laughs> Tell 
telling you. That's why God gave me comedy. He gave me comedy. Because he knew that if I hadn't had some place to release it, you'd be trying to get me out of jail. <laughs> I mean, really, you got to start laughing. You got to figure out a way to enjoy life. We live in a crazy world right now, right? I mean, everything's going crazy. The government is crazy. And, ooh, man. But I, I, I'm, I got to be honest with you, though. The president, he inspires me. I mean, I got to be honest, my entire life, I never thought I could be president. <laughs> Now I'm running around like Oprah, you can be president, and you can be president, everybody can be president. <laughs> Seriously, you guys, you gotta take care of yourself. I love this, it's a community. You can come and you can do and be who you are and, and be honest about yourself. You guys, I was honest about myself recently. I realized that I needed to take some, some, some things in, in my hands about my health, y'all. Amen? Amen? You know, I, 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 was, I, was, I, I was looking and I wasn't, you know, being as healthy as I should be. Um, I realized it when I started recognizing that I stopped picking stuff up. You know, I didn't need that money anyway. <laughs> but I did. I started doing some things different, started making some changes. And, um, and, and through my process, y'all, I lost 40 pounds, y'all. Amen. 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 You know, it's always somebody in the crowd. I see you over there with that little look on your face. Come on, well, dang, how big was she? <laughs> but I did, I learned some things in life, and I, I figured some things out. And, and do you know God is an awesome God? God has created our bodies perfectly, amen? So some things I learned, like, did you know that when we eat certain things and we're eating like a lot of processed foods and things like you know the chips, the cookies, the cakes, you, all the good stuff. <laughs> that our body doesn't know how to process those things. So what God did is he created this protection. So what happens is we get this fat that, that, that covers these foods and, and things that our body doesn't know how to process. So, you know, all this time, I wasn't fat. I was overprotected. <laughs> Y'all, you find your place in this place because we're not going back to church. This church is bringing it back to the people. This is your girl, Shell T. God bless. Yes! <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five and tell him I was overprotected. That is my truth. And I don't care what nobody say. Amen. But I'm still going to pick up that money. Amen. And, uh, I'm not that overprotected. Somebody say amen. You can be that overprotected and broke once some got to give. Amen. One more time, everybody, for the laughter. That is like medicine. Come on, put your hands together for one of the most uh, renowned righteous poets we know. He is also the creator and author of Woke Not Broke. Brother Jermaine Hughes is coming to the stage. Thank you so much. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you guys, good to see you guys. Uh, so I'm gonna do this piece, I think is relevant to this topic we just talked about around healing. Um, there's a place in our lives where we need to understand what we've been through um, and make decisions to make sure that we will 
proceed, right? Regardless of what we've been through. Um, so this poem is uh, entitled, I Am Not Dead. Uh, and it goes, I know that by this time, I was supposed to have been silent. I was supposed to have closed my hands, folded my plans, and, and stood silent. But notice I stand, scoping the stands, holding mic stands, quite vibrant, open as sand, focused on grand prizes. I am not dead. Peep the belief exchange. There were weeks stuck in grief and pain, painted over holding on to bleak memories that say that I am an embarrassment that ought to tarry in territory, boarded up, hugging a chair that's been discarded, buried in scary areas, staring at utter darkness, pardon me, but I remember wishing that I would die, wishing I had military connections so I could build a very complex thing that would allow me to blow my brains up to the sky that would make a red cloud and rain down pieces of eye, but somewhere I read how someone special came down to tear a special drape now, there's no distance between him and I, so instead of me throwing, blowing my brains up, I'm throwing my hands up, thinking I'm grateful for the Savior, because I am not dead. Yeah. Listen, y'all gotta see how I move. Because these, these are not the move, movements of a dude who loses. Too often, Hughes has been cool to removed with blues in his music. Mood as subdued as dudes off the fluid, but it's over. No more mourning every morning, pouring over missed opportunities. This stops because I list off every fixed thought pursuing me. This stuff is new to me, but I am renewed. Every noon, viewing with new view, remove the glue ooze under my shoes, duly screwing me. So everything that was meant to be a tomb for me, I transform it and make it a womb for me and remove from me the fluids that soon would be consuming me and bloom for me beautifully. Dude, you see, I am not dead, but I am alive like a Frankenstein laced with rhymes, electrified by divine grace, straight Strength and pride. Days and nights grace my eyes with hate, dismay, and crime, but I survive because grace makes hate subside. Satan, I am not dead. I am not destined to step in addiction, limping, broke, going nowhere with hopelessness in my eyes. I have seen the king and I cling to his feet as he leads me to the skies. I will not populate the prison, occupy the hospital, operate in sin, or walk towards my demise. I will not feed into being blue, needing new jeans and shoes, seeking to seem real cool just as a disguise. This guy is guys inside the Christ abiding fly inside the vine writing I am not dead I am not dead I am not done diminishing death dangerously driving down demons responsible for opening wounds which will wear me down damp with tears peering into the eyes of those that would tear me down I am stronger so it's not easy for them to bear me now I have prayed up until my eyes are red I have made them in my mind I'm led I have stayed up so it must be said that I am not dead thank you <laughs> All right, we're going to bring Pastor Tanisha to come up and talk to us about number three, which is spirituality. Clap your hands, everybody. It's Pastor. Well, praise the Lord. Before I get to that, how many do believe that laughter is medicine? Wasn't that amazing? Don't you feel better? Thank you, Shell T. Well, if you want to continue laughing, there is a comedy show that's taking place next Saturday. Or this Saturday. Say Saturday. It's at BB Memorial. It's a back-to-school fundraiser where we are going to adopt a school in Sobrani Park and help them with their uh, school supplies. You guys excited about that? We're going to have amazing comedians. My husband will be there. Jay Red is going to be amazing. I have free tickets. Now, our tickets are being sponsored by a secret partner, and they are helping us to sponsor these tickets. But... Tickets are also on sale after church and on Eventbrite. But I want to know right now, who wants free tickets? Who wants free tickets? There you go. There you go. Right here, right here, right here, right here. Oh, uh oh, oh, private. Oh, yeah, coach. Here we go. Yep, sir, sir. That is, if you did not get a free ticket, I'll see you after church and you can buy one. Amen. All right, back to school. No, we're not going back to school. Back to church. Everybody say back to church. It's Back to Church Sunday, and I'm going to speak really briefly about spirituality because this is what we're all about here at The Way. You know, in our world, there's a lot of things that we coin as spiritual, right? You know, you have a lot of friends who are spiritual. They're in the rocks and crystals, and they do like the aroma, and they're really spiritual people. But we want to make it very clear at The Way what our spirituality is. 
and where it comes from. Our spirituality comes from Jesus. We make no qualms about it. How many believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he died? Do you believe that he rose again? Do you believe that he paid the penalty for your sin? This is who we believe in. He is the way, the truth, and the light. This is why we are the way. We are followers of the way. That's what we do. We are here to follow his way. And this is who we stand for. This is what our spirituality is grounded in, in the belief that Jesus is Lord. Someone say, Jesus is Lord. I have a really quick scripture that kind of sums up what our spirituality is about here. It comes from John 4, John 4, 23. Thank you. It says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is a spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is what our spirituality is grounded in, and we hope that if you choose to come back to church, and if you choose to come to the way, that you will experience what this scripture is talking about. It says the time is now. The time has come where, where there's certain things that we're going to look for in a worshiping church. How many know we come here to worship? This is called a house of worship. You know, sometimes we come here and we think this is a, my house of receiving, and it is. But sometimes we're like, God, give me. We turn, turn them into Santa. God, I need. God, I need. I'm coming. I need a blessing. I need. No, 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 no. This is a house of worship. And we have come to worship him in spirit and in truth. First of all, in spirit. We are a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Does anyone believe in the power of the Holy Ghost? If you don't, it's time for you to know there's power in, the, in his blood and his power in his Holy Spirit. He went, we must worship him in spirit. Do you know he wants to add super to our natural? See, we have a natural way of living. We have a natural way of thinking and doing things. But the Holy Spirit is ever present in us, and he's available to each one of us to embolden us, to put a fire inside. How many people need a fire? You need to be lit again. You need to set a blaze again. He gives us power to live, power to be right, power to love. Power to activate injustice. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, and we hope that's when you feel here. Did anyone feel the presence of God when you were here, when we were worshiping? This is what we need. We want to worship God in spirit. And then he also says he wants us to worship him in truth. Now, this is a wonderful statement because Pastor Ernest said it very, we want to be able to come here and be authentic. It is very important that we worship God in truth. That you bring your true self. That you bring all your fears. You bring all your doubts. You bring all your hang-ups. You bring all your questions. All your curiosity. Like, God, what is this? And can you come here in this place and just be like, I just don't have it all together. But, God, I'm coming to you in truth. And I'm coming to here and I'm saying, God, I don't have it all together. But I worship you and I love you and I'll lift you and I'll trust you. He wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. So I love the last part of this verse. It says, the father is seeking. God's looking for something. He's looking for a people. He's looking for somebody who will come and say, yeah, that's me. I got stuff going on, but I will worship. I got things in my life that ain't quite right. But God, you know I trust you. God, I'm going to lay aside all my burdens and all my cares. And I'm going to lift my hands and say, God, you are good. Do I have any worshipers in this place? Do I have any people who would say, God, I, I'm here. You don't have to seek me. You don't have to look for me. I'm right here. Can you wave your hand and begin to say, God, I'm right here. God, you don't have to look for me. You're seeking those who will worship you. And I'm here to say, God, I'm here. I want to worship you in spirit. And I want to worship you in truth. This is what we are about at the way. We want to worship God. And we want to feel his spirit. Raise your hand if you want to feel his spirit in a new and a living way. 
It is available here. And we hope that you will continue to come and worship with us because we love the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. All right, we got about 10 more minutes left of tr to convince you why you should come back to church. And, uh, you know, we have to take an offering, so uh, you should come back to church because during offering, you get to hear great music and walk around and partner with our church to do ministry outside the four walls of the church. You can partner with us by, particularly you that are members, by ensuring that you're generous and that we financially give. If you're hanging out with us for the first time, we don't expect you to give. We would love to know you were here, and so we hope you'll fill out a connection card. All right, I have the blessing to just wrap us up today. The number one reason why we believe you should come back to church, particularly here at The Way, is we are a church that believes in de-churchification. Everybody say that, D, churchification. Say it again, D, churchification. All right, that's the word we made up here at The Way. And it kind of came out of this project that uh, Sister Sharice and uh, soon to be Dr. Sharice McBride, amen. And, uh, and a number of folks here, uh, uh, soon to be Dr. Tiffany Johnson, and, 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 and I see Brother Patrick back there who opened up service, and a number of folks who uh, helped us to do a massive project on the DNA of the way. What was the secret sauce that made the way the way? And so actually every um, mini sermon you've heard this morning has been the secret sauce that you, members of The Way, over the last 15 years or so, have said is what makes The Way special. That we are a church that believes in creating home for people. We are a church that believes in justice. We are a church that believes in a vibrant spirituality grounded in the faith and the teachings of Jesus. And we are a church that believes in de-churchification. And as I was thinking, how can I just kind of put a nice bow on all of this? Uh, I always go to the lectionary because it is a wonderful tool for me and my discipline of preaching and teaching and leading the way of how would God be speaking to us on a regular basis. And this story came up that I think is the epitome of de-churchification. It is in Luke chapter number 15. I'm going to read it real quick. It's the message translation. Jesus is actually giving a parable about how his ministry is about recovering lost souls, people who find themselves locked out, people who find themselves unable to fit into the confines of certain kind of systems and structures. And, 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 and it also speaks to the role that unfortunately some people play in perpetuating people's continuous being locked out, particularly of church. So the scripture simply says, by this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently, I assume, while Jesus was preaching and teaching. And the Pharisees and religion scholars, those the old school haters that happened to go to church, were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. I mean, what kind of hater are you doing? You growling. I was trying to figure out how you let stuff bother you so much, you just, you already went back to a pre-evolutionary state. Somebody say amen. Uh-huh. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. You know when, you know, you grumbling and growling so loud that Jesus got to put a story on you. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? When found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Count on it. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in need of 
in no need of rescue. Verse number eight, or imagine a woman who has 10 coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and scour the house, looking in every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, you can be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. So I say de churchification. The goal of the way is to create space for those who are lost on purpose or on accident. Those who have, for whatever reason, drifted away from a vibrant relationship, not just with God, but also with community. Because this is the truth. In a world that has perfected the art of individuality, we were not created to live alone. And the church, though flawed it is, is God's design to ensure that people you would never hang out with by your choice. You would be forced to be associated with them by our shared connection to God. Dechurchification is then about us losing all of the pretense, all of the the descriptions and the categories. You know, sometimes you can go to church and, and you, hierarchy is so inscribed in church where people get upset when they don't hear you call them by your title. As if when you were born and your mother and father were trying to figure out what to name you, bishop or pastor or evangelist sprung to the front of their mind. Somebody say amen, right? Now, I'm not belittling, you know, the unique roles that God has, many of us serving. And I understand historically, particularly we who come out of the kind of uh, uh, post-slavery era, that titles in church were used to help uh, 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 bestow dignity on black folks whose lives were so degraded and so dehumanized that they could be a janitor or a domestic worker of their oppressor during the week and be called boy and mammy and the N-word. But when they walked in church, they were deacon and they were trustee and they were reverend. So we're not belittling the historical nature of why some of these titles are so meaningful to folk. But how many of you know that your title does not necessarily define your character nor the full person that God has called you to be, even on your job? You are not your title. In your home, you are not your title. You are created in the image of God, and you are a part of God's body. And de-churchification is about us taking seriously that for many of us, we are lost. We, lost, we are lost because we wander off. We're lost because people drop us. We're lost because people harm us. We're lost because we just can't be found. We were put down somewhere and people forgot where they put us. And then systems and structures were built in ways that kept us from being able to be found. And thank God that the church of Jesus, at least the way for sure, is about removing the barriers that keep us lost and separated from God. This whole day has been about us centering the reasons why we believe and understand people don't go to church. And I want to commission to you even if you don't attend the way, don't go through life by yourself. Find community, find people who even in your worst moments can see the good, see the possible, remind you that there is better to come, remind you that God is not through with you, and certainly be reminded that you are loved by the God of all creation. And no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper.
Let's stand to our feet then, everyone. Grab the hand of someone next to you. All these reasons why we should come back to church. Let's start at 10, Brother Mike, and just count down one more time. We come back to church because we worship God. Just stare you close your eyes and just think of the worth that you ascribe to God. Certainly, I want you to know that God deems you worthy. We come back to church because we pray for the world, for one another, for ourselves. We come back to church because we believe in healthy community, that friendships and dope relationships can be found in the house of God. We come back to church because we believe it's home. It's a home base where you can tap in every week and you can meet folks who know and have seen your journey and your struggle. We come back to church because we believe that it helps us cultivate the next generation, the next generation of leaders, the next generation of preachers and teachers and artists, executives, scholars. We come back to church because we are convinced that God is a God of justice. And that the way we believe that justice is what love looks like in the public. And we are called to be that expression. We come back to church because it, that the way we believe that there is healing through laughter, through joy, that we believe in self-care, we believe in therapy, we believe in, in taking seriously, removing the stigma and even along the way, we know that we can laugh ourselves to life, laugh ourselves to wellness as one tool. We come back to church because we believe in a vibrant spirituality grounded in the ways of Jesus. We come back to church because we know it's a blessing to give. We come back to church also because we believe in removing barriers and de churchify ourselves. As your hand, Touch the hand of the person next to you. Just gently squeeze their hand and just remind them that God is welcoming them back to church, back to relationship. Say he loves us. Oh, how he loves yeah. Lord, I pray for the hand that I'm touching today. I pray, God, that they will remember all of these many reasons why being a part of your called out body, the redeemed of the Lord, is such a gift. I pray that they will remind themselves and be reminded and even be convinced that we have the great opportunity to be a people who do life well. Life that is in deep service to you and to one another and certainly to the the healing of our own souls and bodies. So bless the person that I'm touching. I pray that you'll meet their need, their deepest need. I pray that you'll heal their deepest pain. I pray that you will, Lord God, remind them that if they are one of those lost sheep or those lost coins, that we at the way today are trying to help find them. Lord God, so may they be found in your arms and in your love. Lift your hands as also right where you're standing. Just lift your hands and say, it is me, O oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, Lord. Somebody say, I need you. I need your love. I need your peace. I need your power. I need your salvation. I need your victory. Bless God. Touch God. Heal God and deliver. Do all that you are able to do that never fails. And I pray, God, that as we lift our hands to you, Lord, that we will be reminded of all the many ways that you love us, all the many ways that you welcome us back into right relationship with you and with one another and with all creation. Lord, remind us of the many reasons why we serve a God like you, because you love us. 
because you care for us, because you heal us and you sustain us. So God, bless every person whose hands are lifted. Give them everything they need for life and godliness. And above all, break into their reality in a way that is undeniable. Let the power of your spirit, Lord God, may it break yokes and may it loose chains. May it heal bodies, may it restore minds. Lord God, may it, Lord, fix the brokenhearted and may it uplift a troubled soul. Do it for them today and we'll say thank you, Lord. One more time, everyone, lift your voice and say, He loves us, He loves us.